Good evening, and, and thanks very much for that great introduction, David. I was, I was a little concerned when I were to come up tonight and start talking about GM's 100th anniversary that people might think that I've been here the whole time. It, it only feels that way based on the way things have gone over the last few years. But uh, just to close out the story of Duke basketball, so I wasn't really that good, but I did cover this guy, David Thompson. If anybody's a basketball fan, I remember he was, you know, the Michael Jordan of his time. He had a 40-inch vertical leap, approximately twice mine, if I grade myself easily. And, uh, I remember one game in particular where I, I, I covered him and fouled out, and that's not remarkable. What's remarkable is that I think I played about 12 minutes of that game before I got my fifth foul. So it was approximately that time that I realized my dream of the NBA was not a realistic one. So on, on to auto companies. It is really um, great to be here. Dave, first of all, congratulations to you on your new position here as president of the Economic Club. I'm sure you're going to do great things and build on Jordan's, uh, uh, Mr. Jordan's uh, traditions, even, even if you are not uh, quite as tall as him. Um, it is an honor, by the way, to, to speak uh, to you tonight on, on our 100th uh, anniversary. When you think about turning 100, the uh, first thing that comes to your mind is probably jokes, and we had a chance to dig into quite a few of those, so I'll start with one. It, it, it's actually about a 100-year-old woman who was being interviewed by the local news because she was getting married for the fourth time. And the reporter asked her to share her story, and she explained that when she was in her 20s, uh, she married a banker. And when she was in her 40s, she married a circus ringmaster. And when she was in her 70s, she married a minister. And now that she was 100, she was marrying a funeral director. And the reporter was amazed, um, not only at her longevity, but the, the diversity of careers of her husbands. And so, so he said, well, explain that, would you please? And she said, well, I married one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. <laughs> well, suffice it to say that we at GM are not getting married, and in fact, we're not going anywhere. Uh, we're 100 years old, and we plan on staying around. Now, GM's history might not be quite as colorful as that 100-year-old woman that I just described, but it's actually pretty extraordinary in its own right. So let's start with a little bit of history. A hundred years ago, and, and this was a time in which the auto industry was in was a startup business. And, and so there were thousands of automotive startups that literally were incorporated and, and disappeared almost as quickly as they showed up. Many never actually even built their first car. Um, at that time, uh, my predecessors at GM began what was an extraordinary experiment. Their idea was to bring together a whole bunch of auto companies, each led by a strong and determined entrepreneur, unite them under one roof, and build the best automotive enterprise in the world, one committed to bringing mobility to people around the globe. And against all odds, that's exactly what they did. And for most of the last hundred years, GM has stood among the world's leading automakers, and now we have the tremendous opportunity to continue that legacy into our company's second century. GM Centennial comes at a time that I think is a very interesting, exciting, and challenging one for our industry. Really, the entire world is watching us now, hoping for a breakthrough in personal transportation that will address the very real environmental and energy challenges facing nations around the world. And the question is, who will lead the reinvention of the automobile? This morning, we served notice that GM intends to be a big player in that race, when we unveil, unveil the production version of our upcoming Chevrolet Volt extended range electric vehicle. We showed the Volt concept at the Detroit Auto Show about 20 months ago, and it's fair to say that no concept car in my GM career has created more excitement, certainly here in the U.S., but in fact, as we've shown it around the world. When running off its battery, which can be charged in a standard electrical outlet, the Volt operates as a traditional battery electric vehicle with a driving range of about 40 miles, a range, by the way, which we chose to target because that's less than the average daily commute for three quarters of Americans. And when the driver of the Volt needs to go more than 40 miles, a small flex fuel engine will kick in, generate the electricity necessary to keep the car going for hundreds of additional miles. If you drive less than 40 miles a day, you could own a Volt and never have to buy a drop of gasoline. The Volt is real, it's under development, and we remain focused on getting it into the Chevrolet showrooms by the end of 2010. 
Now the car is amazing in and of itself, but beyond that, the Volt is really symbolic of what's going on at General Motors today. For certain, that means things like cutting edge technology and exciting design and fast and efficient product development, but it's, it's more important than that. The Volt symbolizes General Motors' commitment to the future, just the kind of technological innovation that our industry needs to respond to today's and tomorrow's energy and environmental challenges. We thought that revealing the production version of the Volt would be a great way to open our second century. Now being 100 years old has its advantages, in our case things like very deep engineering and technological expertise, solid brands, strong representation in almost all the key auto markets around the world, and a very talented and passionate global team of employees. But being 100 also brings some disadvantages, like in GM's case, pension and health care legacy costs here in the U.S. From 1993 to 2007, 15-year period, we spent a total of $103 billion to fund U.S. pensions and retiree health care costs, an average of about $7 billion a year. Needless to say, that's a huge competitive advantage. Disadvantage, excuse me. <laughs> you were probably really anxious to hear my next sentence. More straightforward than that. The GM, our strategy in recent years has been to try to leverage the advantages of being 100 years old. So, for example, we've really changed the way we run our business to take advantage of the fact that we've got these capabilities around the world, but we now run them in a much more globally integrated fashion to make sure we can take full advantage of our scale and scope in countries around the world. And also by focusing on accelerating our growth in emerging markets, which I'll, I'll comment on in a minute. But at the same time, we've taken on the task to aggressively address the disadvantages that come with being 100. For example, the legacy costs I mentioned a minute ago. Well, as, as a result of a lot of tough actions taken over the past several years and hard work with our unions, we now expect our cash spending on U.S. pensions and retiree health care to decline from that average that I mentioned of about $7 billion a year over the last 15 years to about a billion dollars a year starting in 2010. This savings, about $6 billion a year, really sets the stage for GM's second 100 years. A tremendous opportunity not only to improve our earnings and our balance sheet, which we certainly need to do, but even more importantly, more cash to invest in new products and advanced propulsion technology. Now in the context of all the work we've been doing at GM in recent years to position the company for ongoing profitability and growth, it's fair to say that the rather, rather sudden plunge in U.S. auto demand hasn't come at a very good time for us. In response to some very difficult developments, which David mentioned, housing slump, credit crisis, record commodity and oil prices, eroding consumer confidence, just to name a few, auto sales plummeted down to the 13 million unit annual rate range the la over the last three months, a level, by the way, that we really haven't operated in, the, at this country, in this country since 1992. And in addition to that, the consumers that remained in the market have tended to move away from trucks and SUVs, which have historically been more profitable, to cars and crossovers. In response to this, we've had to move and move fast, taking further tough but necessary actions to ensure our future success. To respond to the rapid change in auto sales mix, 18 out of our next 19 new product launches will be cars or crossovers. By the way, 11 out of our last 13 have been cars or crossovers here in the U.S. We're increasing production at a number of car plants. We also announced that we would cease production at four of our truck plants. Now, in addition to these product and manufacturing moves, we also announced in July initiatives to bolster our liquidity by about $15 billion through year-end 2009, most of it from actions internal to the company, self-help, we call it, since the financial markets are so weak. All these steps are in addition to those that we've taken over the past three years as part of a North American turnaround plan where we've actually made quite a bit of progress, more than I think most people thought possible. We've reduced our annual fixed cost base in the company, we call it structural cost, in North America by $9 billion over the last three years and we'll take another five to six billion out of that over the next three years. So $15 billion of structural cost reduction, that's a huge number, a huge percentage of our fixed cost base in North America, by the way. We negotiated a new labor agreement with our primary union last year that in addition to addressing our health care cost burden, as I mentioned before, 
will enable us to significantly improve our competitive position in the U.S. by introducing new wage rate structures. We continue to improve vehicle quality, evidenced by cars like the Chevy Malibu, which was recently ranked best in initial quality in the very competitive midsize car segment by J.D. Power & Associates. And probably most importantly, we're turning out really exciting and well-accepted products like the Cadillac CTS, Motor Trend 2008 Car of the Year, the Buick Enclave, and as already mentioned, the Chevy Malibu, which was the 2008 North American Car of the Year. And I'd add in addition to that work here in North America and the U.S., we're making good progress in growing our business in emerging markets, markets like China, Brazil, Russia, India. <clears throat> emerging markets, by the way, they've really grown as a percent of the total global auto industry. They were about 20% of auto industry sales 10 years ago. Last year, they were 38% of industry sales. And that growth is continuing and will continue over the next decade. In total last year, GM sold more than 9 million cars and trucks globally. That's third time in a row and only the fourth time in our history. And, and actually, we did it by setting all-time sales records in our automotive regions outside of North America. About 60% of our sales uh, last year were outside the U.S. That number is actually a little higher this year, uh, supported by the opening of three all-new assembly plants in places like Russia, India, and Mexico. <clears throat> No emerging market is having a greater impact on the auto industry today than China. Just 10 years ago, auto sales in China totaled for the industry as a whole 1.7 million units. Last year, they reached nearly 8.5 million units, second now, second largest national market in the world, second to the U.S., and catching up fast, to be honest. We at GM have been fortunate to participate in this, in this growth. Ten years ago, we sold about 60,000 units in China. In 2007, in conjunction with our Chinese partners, we sold over a million units, making China our second largest national market and GM the leading international automaker in this important market. And what's interesting, China's economic growth is spurring economic growth in other parts of the world too, especially other emerging markets, which is really driving red-hot auto sales in many of these countries. A great example is Russia, where industry sales have tripled over the last 10 years and where GM recently moved into the top position among all international brands. We sold less than 5,000 units in Russia, around 2,000. This year we accept, expect to sell 400,000 units. In that same period, industry sales in India, where half the country's population, huge population, 1.2 billion people, are under the age 25, sales in, that in, in, in India have nearly quadrupled over the last 10 years. And don't forget South America, where we've traditionally been number one for a number of years, and other emerging markets around the world. All these markets, as they get growing income, moving more people into the middle class, they have low vehicle ownership, they're growing rapidly, and we're trying to move aggressively across the board. And so while our traditional markets, U.S. and Western Europe, are still extremely important to GM's future, if we want to be successful in the years to come, we also have to take full advantage of these emerging markets. Now, this all sounds like a pretty good news story so far, but the fact is all this growth in emerging markets has contributed to significantly, significantly to what we believe is the most important challenge facing the global auto industry today, and that's the need to develop robust alternatives to the auto industry's traditional, almost complete reliance on oil to power our vehicles. Energy supply, sustainable mobility, CO2 emissions, fuel economy, these are topics of great concern here in the U.S. for certain, but actually all around the world. Of immediate concern in the U.S., of course, has been the very rapid and sudden rise in oil prices. Most of the experts that we consult with view that the higher prices are really part of a long-term structural trend towards higher energy costs due to this greater demand around the world, Therefore, it's a structural change, not a cyclical change. And that's why we at GM believe that the global auto industry must develop alternative sources of propulsion based on diverse sources of energy. The new technology that seems to generate the most interest here in the U.S., and one that we're working very hard to bring to market, is, as we started out discussing, electrically driven vehicles. And actually, we're focused now on two basic kinds of electric vehicles fuel cell powered vehicles, which drive on electricity created by the hydrogen fuel cell, and battery driven vehicles. 
When it comes to fuel cells, we've been making steady progress since we introduced our first concept in 2002. Most recently, we've launched a 100-vehicle test fleet of fuel cell-powered Chevy Equinox SUVs. We're giving them to real-life customers to use around the country. Believe it or not, those customers don't always treat their cars like our engineers do, so we're learning a lot from that. And this is the world's largest fuel cell test fleet on the road today. And as I discussed in some detail a few minutes ago, we remain fully focused on bringing the Chevy Volt to market by the end of 2010. The key to getting the Volt on the road is advanced lithium ion battery technology. And we're running all out to develop a battery pack that'll do everything that we need and we know our customers expect in their vehicle. For close to a year now, we've run prototype battery packs through test after test and our confidence in their ability to deliver the, the required power, range, safety, reliability, and quality has grown with every lap around our proving ground. While we believe that electrically driven vehicles are the best long-term solution for addressing society's energy and environmental concerns vis-a-vis -vis the automobile, we also need to take other actions if we want to address the energy security issue in the nearer term. And it's increasingly clear to us that biofuels are the best bet to do this over a surprisingly short time frame. Why? Because there are already more than 7 million flex fuel vehicles on the road in the U.S. right now. More than 3 million from GM alone, vehicles that could be running on biofuels like ethanol if it were more readily available. In fact, if all the flex fuel vehicles that General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler have on the road today, plus those that we um, together have committed to produce over the next 12 years through 2020, if all those vehicles were to run on bio biofuels, we'd save about 30 billion gallons of gasoline annually, or about 18 percent of the projected petroleum usage at that time. And if all manufacturers in the U.S. made that same commitment, we'd raise the savings to 32 percent of petroleum usage. Nothing else we can do gets even close to that kind of impact that soon. Nothing. Beyond our commitment to providing vehicles that are E85 capable, GM has recently invested in two next generation biofuel startups that are among the leaders in developing so-called cellulosic ethanol. These startups have developed proprietary processes to produce ethanol using renewables like agricultural waste, municipal waste, discarded plastic, even old tires, and to do so much more efficiently than we can do today. These are the kind of breakthroughs that ultimately are going to be the key to realizing the full potential of ethanol. Now, last but not least in our global advanced propulsion strategy is our rapidly expanding application of hybrid technology, which helps to reduce our use of oil by improving fuel economy. GM currently has six hybrids on the road, with three more on the way by mid-2009. These include the Saturn View Green Line, which, gets, which is a high-value hybrid system gets the, the highest fuel economy of any sport utility on the road today at a great price on highway. The Cadillac Escalade two-mode hybrid, which features the industry's most sophisticated hybrid technology, allows it to get about 50% better city fuel economy than regular conventional engines. In fact, the same fuel economy as a mid-sized car with a four-cylinder engine would get in city driving. So we have a lot going on in the area of advanced propulsion technology. But it's also clear that solving our country's energy challenge is going to be a team sport. As I had the opportunity to discuss in my comments at the Senate Energy Summit last Friday, we need a strong commitment from all sectors of our society to develop and implement the technologies that allow us to achieve our mutual goals. GM and other automakers need to lead by developing technologies and then driving their costs down. We understand this. We're all prepared to do this but there are important roles for others, like the government. Last year's energy bill laid the groundwork for a comprehensive and forward-looking U.S. energy policy, one that addresses both energy demand and energy supply. And from our perspective, it's time for the U.S. to do more to take control of our energy future. As a nation, we have the capability to do this and faster than most people think. In addition to a massive investment in new technologies and a commitment from all sectors of the U.S. economy, we need a clear long-term policy, consistency of direction, and alignment of regulation. We'll need for the government 
to proactively support the development of alternative fuel technology, biofuels, fuel cells, advanced batteries, and incentivize customers through tax credits, fuel subsidies, and so on, so that customers are willing to adapt these exciting new technologies in big scale. In addition, when the Congress last year passed the Energy Independence and Security Act, that act which calls for a massive 40 percent increase in fuel economy standards for cars and light trucks, they included the Advanced Technology Vehicle Manufacturing Incentive Program. This program authorized $25 billion in direct loans to automakers and suppliers to accelerate the development of advanced technology vehicles. Nobody called it a bailout then because it wasn't, and it still isn't. The provision was included because the Act recognized the huge cost of the entire auto industry, manufacturers and suppliers, of achieving these new fuel efficiency standards. Billions of dollars of cost, hundreds of billions of dollars of cost. And frankly, as the capital market conditions have significantly worsened since the bill's passage, the needs for these loans is stronger than ever. We hope that Congress authorizes funding of this authority during their September session. So to wrap it up, how does it feel to be 100? Well, for one thing, as I said, you discover there are a lot, a lot of jokes out there about getting, getting older. And for example, there's the one about Herman, who happens to be 100 years old. One day, Herman was out driving his car when his cell phone rang. He answered it, and he heard his wife warning him frantically, Herman, be careful. I just heard on the radio that a, there's a car going the wrong way on the beltway. Honey, said Herman, it's not one of them, it's hundreds of them. <laughs> well, at GM, it doesn't feel like we're going the wrong way at all. It feels like we're heading exactly where we want to, where automotive consumers want us to, and it feels like we're just getting started all over again. Going forward, we at GM are determined to demonstrate to the world that we're more than a 100-year-old company. We're a company that is ready to lead for the next 100 years. The promise of GM today remains the, pro today remains the promise of GM in 1908, to be the best auto company in the world, dedicated to serving the needs of local consumers and communities all around the globe. And we're committed to leading the industry on the most important issue we face over the next generation, the development of alternative fuel propulsion. Thanks so much for having us here to help celebrate GM's 100th birthday. Let me turn it back to David and respond to some questions. Thank you. I promised the first question to Evelyn, and where is Evelyn Davis? Okay. It has to be a question, not a comment, right? Um, good evening, I'm Evelyn Y. Davis, editor of Highlights and Lowlights of Washington, D.C. I'm the own, I'm stock and aiding companies, and I'm Rick Wagner's favorite General Motors stockholder. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, while I personally am very much for the loan, as a Washington insider, know, I know that it will be almost impossible to get this passed for the simple reasons if they were to give General Motors the loan, then everybody else is going to ask for one too. And uh, this is going to be impossible. And also I'm surprised at your timing that you didn't wait till after election while it might have been more possible. And my second question is, what is General Motors doing to use its influence to get the uptick rule reinstated, which in my opinion and the opinion of other sophisticated 
investors is the reason why we have all this volatility in the stock market. You know, a few days, the market is up, then the shorts come in and it goes down. We've had this ever since this uptick rail was abolished. Thank, thanks, Evelyn. Maybe I'll, let me take a shot at, at your first question. I'm not sure I'm up to date on the uptick rule, but I'm going to ask Ken Cole, who runs our government relations activities, to, <laughs> to get right into that. Um, I mean, just to be clear, you know, the, 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 uh, what was included in the Energy Act 07 was $25 billion of direct loans available to the industry, all manufacturers and suppliers. And it's not uh, just to be doled out on some pro rata basis. Um, only projects which um, support uh, significant improvements in fuel economy, generally new kinds of technologies. In our case, Chevy Volt would be eligible for some loan funding, I think. Um, our two-mode hybrid systems. I see Z there. I'm sure he's got the list for Ford. And, and if John Bazella was here tonight, he'd give us the list for Chrysler. And by the way, um, others too, non-US dom dom domicile companies. So, um, you know, it, it, it's available for everyone in, in the industry. Um, and again, I would stress, I mean, the, the, the CBO estimated the cost to the industry to comply with, with the new fuel economy regulations, which we all, by the way, supported, was, was well over $100 billion. And most of that was on, turns out to be, I think, $80 billion on, on, the, on the domestics. I'm looking at my colleagues to, uh, to correct me if I'm wrong. They're saying I'm OK. Um, and and uh, so, so the idea is that this, this, is, a, this is a fund for, for the industry. And so while I'd love to have $25 billion of low-cost loans, I, I don't, we're not asking for that for GM. Okay. Thanks, Evelyn. Um, what, steps, what three steps should the new administration take uh, to strengthen our economy and the prospects for General Motors? If I knew that, I'd have Hank Paulson's job, I think. But um, look, I, I think, I think uh, I'm not sure these, these are one, two, three out of the box. But, but the structural issues, as, as we see, are, are, criti are, are critical. Our energy policy, um, and I think we do need not just some short-term fixes, but we need a vision, and we need to stick with some stuff even when oil prices go down or go up. Uh, so I'd say that's a fundamental bin building block. Uh, second of all, um, you know, health care is a huge issue for this country and need, can, can, I think, be significantly improved cost and quality with, with uh, some actions that I don't think would be that difficult, as someone who doesn't live in Washington, D.C., would observe probably incorrectly. And then um, third, I think uh, the, the whole focus on um, recognizing the importance of the manufacturing sector at, being a, at the risk of being a bit parochial here. The manufacturing sector drives huge technology investments, a huge employment. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think uh, sometimes the, va the value of the sector has been somewhat underappreciated as, as, as an important sector in the U.S. economy. So I would put a lot of effort on that. Uh, what about natural gas? Uh, you didn't mention that. Uh, what is your view about natural gas for, for cars? Yeah, um, we um, actually, a number of countries in the world uh, do um, encourage and, uh, the, the supply and, and encourage us to produce vehicles that run on natural gas. We do that. Um, there is a cost to fit vehicles to be able to use CNG. Um, and, and so I think for that to be a reality in the U.S., we could do that. We'd all need some lead time. Um, we need to be convinced that there would be um, both uh, the supply, ongoing supply of natural gas easily available to automotive consumers. And, and then the second thing, the, the, you know, we'd have to have some confidence, uh, the consumer would have to have some confidence that the cost will stay competitive for a long term. Uh, we, I, I don't rule that out, by the way, as an option. I would say it's something that's come onto the table a little more recently. Um, and so we're watching with interest, uh, Boone Pickens and, and Arby McClendon and others. And if, if they can come up with some good ideas there, we are more than willing to work with them. What about uh, joint ventures? You had a joint venture with Fiat at one point. Do you envision any further joint ventures of that type, or are you going to go it alone? Yeah, we've seen a lot of this. I think as we, uh, particularly the pressure on the stuff I was talking about tonight, some of these advanced propulsion technologies and fuel economy improvements, I do not think most manufacturers can stand alone and handle all that investment. So you're going to see a lot more cooperation. Uh, we have worked together with uh, a Daimler, Chrysler, and BMW to develop our two-mode hybrid system. We work with Ford to develop a six-speed transmission that both they and we are producing a lot of. And I think um, as we look forward, we work with Isuzu on diesel engines um, and, and, um, 
Uh, we, we own half of, a, of an Italian diesel engine manufacturer. I think you're going to see more of that uh, from us, and you're going to see um, more of that across the industry, because it is very hard for any manufacturer to carry the cost of trying to run all of these different technologies. And we, people ask me, well, why don't you just pick one and ride that? I said, well, I'd do it if I knew which one was going to win. But if, if I pick the loser, then the company's out of business. So we're in a period like the auto industry was kind of in its first 15 years, when it, 10 years, 15. It wasn't clear if petroleum or uh, battery power, even back then. Thomas Edison was picking battery power back in those days, and, and the least surprising factoid of the day. And, and uh, steam power. And p there were people who were betting on all those technologies and finally funneled down to to oil, and, and so now we're back into a stage where that funnel is opening back up. And is it going to be hydrogen? Is it going to be uh, batteries? Is it going to be biofuels? Um, or hybrids going to be enough? And, and so I think for now you're going to see OEMs being forced to cooperate more. And um, you know, it's, so just stay tuned on that. Here, Mr. Wagner, I own uh, a Cadillac and I own a BMW, both fine automobiles. I've owned several Cadillacs. One of the things that's different about uh, General Motors and BMW is the service. Uh, the price points are a little different, I'll admit that. I was just curious about your views on that. The, the point being, the BMW is a much more service-friendly environment uh, than is Cadillac. And to me, uh, that's not an insignificant thing. And I was, I was just interested in your perspective. Yeah, well, you must have been one of the BMW owners that figured out how to get that iDrive system to work, right? Because otherwise you wouldn't be saying that. Sorry, okay, I couldn't. I know all you guys drive BMWs, but I couldn't resist. Um, well, you know, to, to be perfectly honest, uh, if we were sitting in another part of the country, I could, you know, someone might comment to me on the great service they get from their dealer. So uh, I can only answer sort of in, in, in the broader aggregates. You look at the customer service, uh, surveys that are done by independent parties for the industry. And generally, um, our brands do pretty well, which tells me on balance, our dealers do a pretty good job. It's for sure true. We got 7,000 dealership points in the US. Some of them don't do a good job. But I would say in this day and age, particularly in a competitive environment, increasingly that's getting weeded out because so many customers are, are like you. I mean, there, there's a lot of choices for great products. They really want the whole um, experience to be as easy and carefree as possible. So I would even bet tonight there's probably a Cadillac dealer in the room here who will be anxious to talk to you afterwards and explain to you how his service will be better than your BMW dealers and offer you a good deal to try a Cadillac. If Chrysler does not make it, uh, what would be the impact on General Motors, good or bad? Well, um, I, uh, our industry is a weird one. Um, it's an industry which consolidation, let's take Europe as an example, if, if you're not that familiar with Europe. There's probably, what, 10 manufacturers in Europe that have somewhere between 7 and 11, 12 percent market share across the continent. It makes no sense at all. And so I said 15 years ago that this is an industry that needs to consolidate. 15 years later, you know, there really hasn't been any consolidation. A couple of very small guys have, have been bought up and, and resold. Um, and what happens is auto companies just don't seem to go away. A few years ago, Mitsubishi in Japan was, you know, rumored to be about out of the, you know, out of the business. And here we are five years later, they're still in and, you know, still try, trying to sell. So I myself do not count on, on somebody going out of, uh, out of business, um, Chrysler or, or anybody else. I, I just... I think, you know, things, brands can be bought and sold, that kind of stuff would happen. I'd be surprised to, to see an OEM really just, ju just disappear. It just, just, history would say it, it's, it's not going to play out. So, that's the way I see it. Well, I don't have a comment on Lehman Brothers. Um, nor do I have a comment on Fannie and Freddie or, 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 or Bear Stearns, but, um, or perhaps AIG. Um, look, this isn't a subsidy for General Motors, as I said. The, 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 the issue on the table is uh, the Energy Act, in the interest of the country, by the way, um, and against kind of market forces, um, 
have basically said, look, we want to move away from as much reliance on oil, and so we're going to significantly improve fuel economy requirements, which is going to require new technologies, 100 billion spending, et cetera, et cetera. And so as part of that, the government is willing to provide direct loans of, of 25 billion to people who have projects which qualify. So in that sense, um, it's no more a subsidy for GM than it would be for any other company that had these kind of projects which, which qualified. To your point of you know, being, um, I don't apologize, because in my view, although maybe Z and Bruce will, sitting at your table will disagree, I mean, because GM has built the best trucks and SUVs in the world, I'm not apologizing for that. Uh, U.S. consumers wanted to buy it, and by the way, other manufacturers, not U.S. domicile, have rushed into that industry um, because it's the important consumer base and it's been highly profitable, and when gas prices are low, that's what some people wanted to buy. Um, I would say, I certainly, uh, if, I, if we had a replay, I'd love to have had a broader car lineup too, but, but again, to be fair, 11 out of our last, we, we saw the fact that energy prices were going to go up as we saw growth in China. We just didn't expect them to double in about 15 minutes, to be honest. But, you know, 11 out of our last 13 products have been cars, 18 out of our next 19 will be cars and crossovers. So you will see us be very, very aggressive in, in the car game as well, I promise. L loans or no loans, to be honest. Um, what car do you drive? Well, um, we, we have three sons, so we have about nine million cars uh, in various states of repair and capability. The one car that we don't have is a Corvette ZR1, which all three of my sons want me to get, and I'm waiting till they're all out of the house for good to get that for myself. But um, to, to be for obvious reasons. But what I do is um, almost every weekend I bring home a different car, frequently a competitive car. I'll be glad to give you a review of some of the Fords and. Chrysler's and Toyotas. I saw Joe Cooper here too tonight. Um, but uh, so what I try to do is get exposed to all sorts of different cars. What I actually own personally, um, I just bought a Pontiac Solstice. Um, had a little extra turbocharger put on the engine. Don't tell my sons that. Um, a, a, a Chevy uh, SSR, which was given to me by my sons for my 50th birthday, although I had to pay for it. Um, <laughs> Trailblazer SS. Uh, Saturn View, and um, we have on order a Cadillac CTS, so we've got like fleet rates on the insurance. <laughs> on your advertising, do you see any major changes in General Motors' advertising strategy, and are you going to do more on the internet versus television and radio? Yeah, huge, huge. I mean, an excellent question, um, I, and I don't think um, we're probably different than a lot of other traditional big advertisers. Um, we're shifting um, reasonable amounts of our, of our ad budget uh, um, to internet. And I would say to the point where we're probably sp you know, sp spilling some, some, some good money because we want to get on that and learn. And what we've learned, we've learned some interesting things, that a lot of the things that are drilled into your head for excellence in some of the print or, or um, TV type advertising actually isn't the right way to think about internet-based advertising. So, um, really, the game is changing. I think the whole the whole advertising industry is changing, and um, you know the things that we've all been taught taught about good marketing practices don't necessarily work on the internet. So I, th I think it is the most exciting um, opportunity, uh, maybe across business, because you know we all know about productivity, quality, um, all this sort of stuff. Um, advertising spend, marketing spend, has generally been the area of business that I think um, has been less supported by really, really um, accurate analyticals. Bo Jones is really going, you're wrong, Rick. We can tell you whatever you want to know. I, I know you can, Bo, but not everybody does as well as you do. But um, I mean, we're going to be able to get great data on this internet. We get great data on some of the internet advertising. I mean, you know if you spend you know, 500 bucks here, you know what you're going to get back from it. And that, that's going to be a powerful thing that I think is going to affect so many industries going forward. Two final questions. Uh, next to last, what do you plan to do about or with GMAC? Well, we um, remain a 49% owner of GMAC. We sold 51% to Cerberus. And um, what we plan to do is, is basically, from the standpoint of the tough credit conditions, we have uh, significantly, um, let me say, changed a lot of our consumer financing offer. We've reduced the amount of leasing we do in the U.S. Um, you know, we used to run maybe across all of our brands in the range, depending on the month, 15 to 20 percent, maybe 20 percent. It's been down, well down in the single digits the last couple of months. 
And then uh, because of the cost of credit uh, we, and the, the tighter availability of credit, sort of the cost of our, our, our interest rate programs has gone up quite a bit as well. So frankly, what we've done is shifted more of our incentive budget to, to cash type uh, uh, support. Um, and uh, that has enabled GMAC to take its asset base down, which I think during this tight credit time is, is a good way for it to, it to kind of ride, ride out the storm. But you know, long term, we plan on staying in the credit business with GMAC, with services our partner for the long term. We think it's an important part of success in the auto business. It is one of the factors for us and others that are, that are driving the auto market down. Our, our head of sales um, figures that for us, uh, it's probably costing us something like 10 or 15,000 units a month over the last, uh, say, first half of the year, the tighter credit terms. That number could probably be a little higher as, as we look forward. So that, that's not insignificant. Last question is, if you had gone to the NBA instead of General Motors, what do you think you'd be doing today? <laughs> I might. Uh, I might be going back to my career prior to playing basketball, which was like lawn services when I was a kid. <laughs> Starting when I was like 11 years old, I used to cut like everybody's lawn in the neighborhood for $2. Uh, my dad actually paid for the gas. I owe him for that now that I think about it. But uh, so, and I made a pretty good, I made enough to buy my first Camaro then. So that's probably what I'd be doing, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you very much, Rick. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rick.